So today I have a Laura Jean Jackets, the founder and the CEO of Jean Jackets Consulting LLC, positioning and development firm that helps small business scale sustainability. And she's also a creative team of One Man Show by Jeff Brown, Adopted One, and she recently got involved in Flatbush United. So Laura, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Uh, you are such a powerful woman. And when you said yes, I got super excited. <laughs> you're a creative force for so many people and you're just mastermind behind all of the good stuff. So like before we jump in into anything, how do you describe yourself and what is the one fan fact that people don't really know about you? Hmm. I, I'm still honestly still trying to figure out how to describe myself because I've done so many different things. A word that comes to me is creator. Like I can create just about anything. Um, but people often describe me as like a connector, a bridge, a navigator in a lot of the work that I do, even in like my friendships. And so I would consider myself someone that is a resource to people. You asked, what's a fun fact about me? Mm -hmm, that most people don't know about you. I have an identical twin sister named Lori. What? Yeah, she was sitting here. We sound the same. We look exactly the same. You would not be able to tell the difference unless you know us on like a personal level. We're, we're slightly different heights and I'm a little bit more um, darker in complexion than her. She has like a yellow undertone and I'm red. Um, and so that's like slight differences that most people, she gets golden during the summer. I get like more darker. That's a fun fact. I love that. I had no idea you had an identical twin. Yeah, I mentioned that to one person last week and she freaked out because she's scared of twins. It's like a phobia that she has. And so it was very unique to hear that. I know some cultures are like that. Really? Twins, yeah. So that was like the first time. But yeah, that's a fun fact about me. That is really cool. So I love that you described yourself as a connector and a bridge and someone who is a resource for a lot of people. I think it was a couple of weeks ago when we were on the call and we had a conversation about really knowing ourselves and our heritage and spirituality as well. How do you connect within yourself and how do you connect with your heritage and how do you connect with your own creativity? Yeah, so I think like, like everyone's experiencing like this pandemic and I think like going inward is my process right now. I think I've always had moments of checking in and like checking my intuition and my emotions. But I think right now I've been in a very unique process of actually going through the emotions, especially the difficult ones. Um, and kind of like working on like, what does daily self reflection rituals look like? I think when it comes to like my heritage, like I'm Haitian American, I could say, I always laugh, but I say I'm half a generation. American, Haitian American, because um, half of my siblings are born in Haiti and four of us are born here. And so when it comes to like heritage or spirituality, whatever you want to call it, ancestry, I come from very like spiritual parents and, you know, we're about like, you know, connecting with the earth and connecting with like our African roots and like really thanking, you know, our ancestors and really trusting intuition and using creative vision. To, to get through difficult times and using creation. Like I come from, you know, sem seamstress mothers, like my mother, my grandmother, they're creating, you know, my father um, was all about like, just like laughing and joking and whatever that looks like, I may be babbling, but I think that heritage for us, for our generation is something that we're defining, right? Like we're, I mean, I know you're like a uh, immigrant here, I think for those of us who are a little bit younger, we're now getting to the point of like defining our own heritage and what does that look like, especially in the new times that we're in. So for me, my heritage is just who I am. It's how I choose to show up every day, whether my head is wrapped, whether my hair is buzz cut, whether I'm wearing like neutral colors or bright colors or like with how I speak and who I connect with because your heritage or your lineage or your ancestry affects people that are not even related to you by blood. And I, if we if we look at that on a broader scale, we would approach heritage differently as well. We would start redefining that it's it's like unlearning because the way my 
mother may have grown up or my grandmother may have grown up and what their mothers taught them and their fathers taught them are very different in the world that we live in. And so I'm in the process of like redefining who I am. And it's been fun. It's been very interesting. So I hope I um, I didn't say too much, but... (laughs) No, there's no such thing as saying too much. I love that. Unlearning, unlearning. Is there a specific process that you unlearn anything that is huge to you or how that process looks like for you? Um, let me try to be specific in what happens. I think like I've been moving very slow. I'm a very fast paced person. I have my hands in everything. The past like three months has been like forcefully shut down right um against like our own rights right in in this country but i think that to me felt like not the not the the government mandating us to stay in but more so like this pandemic has made room i think for those of us who have never grieved properly to make time for that thing grieving is part of that process and for me i've been going through a grieving process, whether it's like someone dying or whether that's me like releasing um, what once was or even adjusting to like, hey, like that life that I had three months ago is gone. I get to grieve what was, but like moving through it and like letting it go. And so I've been practicing a lot of slow movement, resting, cooking um, at home where I love cooking. Cooking is a stress relief for me, but like if I look at who I was like three months ago, like I barely had time to cook a meal and being gentle like with myself, like, you know, I'm in a marriage and like evening myself out, tempering myself out, um, you know, because I have a lot of fire, but the fire doesn't need to be like, like this huge flame every day. And I think for those of us who always have like that flame in it and always have that energy, it's always connecting and empathic and really rely on like these in-person connections to be fueled up. Um, it's been an adjustment for me. And so I think so moving slow, sleeping, resting, being okay if like I spend a day eating junk food, writing, you know, today I'm actually in my physical office right now because I've been in a, like a little slump, a little funk the past couple of days. And I say, you know what, let me just get up and walk. And I walk from my um, house to my office. And as I was walking, I was just like, when was the last time that I recorded like my voice? And that felt meditative to me. And so I just was recording like thoughts as I was walking. And I think that's, you know, like tapping into some of that um, because I cringe when I hear my voice on video or camera. And so I'm like, you know, it could be that you need to hear your voice more. For yourself and not in an interview or like you know online for for social media purposes right and that to me has been like helping that process a lot if that makes sense like me just delving into myself but it doesn't have to look like oh you know I'm putting a mask on you know and like what commercialized self-care looks like it's not always what it is um, and like just every day trusting my intuition on what that gets to be. If it's one day that I'm sleeping for 24 hours, I'll sleep for 24 hours. If it's one day where, you know, um, that type of um, introspection looks like me wrapping my hair, you know, and me taking that time to like follow that pattern, choosing the color, you know, you know, being more intentional in that process, that to me helps. I love that. Listening to yourself and not the commercialized self-care. That is such a huge distinction and a lot of people get confused by it. I almost feel like the image of self-care is getting a nails done or like a facial done and it is more internal. That's rooted like the self-care like and this is not for like all platforms right like there's platforms like that's always been who they are. You know, they've always done these things. I know people that they've always taken baths. They love baths. They've always put rose petals. You know, they've always put these things like this is them. Um, But I think that's rooted in like capitalism, right? A lot of the way that self-care has become the way that it is, where it's even pressure for the average person to self-care because they don't know if they're doing it right. There's no such thing. It's how you feel. If, you know, self-care to you is like treating yourself to some ice cream, you know, at the end of the week, or if it's like dipping your toes in like the pool for like 30 minutes or like walking around your house completely naked. Some people don't do that. 
right? And it looks different. Like my version of self-care should not be what you're comparing your version of self-care to. And I think it's become very competitive and comparative and, you know, like just almost toxic in how it's promoted in this country that some people is just like, tell me what to do. What, what do you feel inside you should be doing right now? If it's like negative emotions coming up, address it and then let it go. That's the one thing. It's like, as this work is happening, I'm like, I can, I think we can sit in it for like a day, but it's one running away from those emotions, especially like self-care. Self-care brings you down to a level where you have to like face yourself. And I think some people cannot face themselves, cannot be alone with themselves, cannot have those difficult conversations with themselves, cannot grieve by themselves that's where I would want to see the self-care movement kind of go to where it's just like go inward and it's not about isolation it's about finding solitude and then tapping back into community once you've done it, that work or some of that work to say where do I need support from my community whether that's your close family your chosen family you know external family like platforms that can provide you tools you know without like it being so pressure filled it's it's difficult and there's a lot of shame around like rest, a lot of shame and guilt around rest. You always have to be grinding and hustling. And, it, and it's like, even when I'm saying this, I'm like, I'm hustle and grind queen. Like that's something I've always done. But I realized that a lot of that was rooted in survival, not thriving. I've never looked at working as like something that I could thrive in. And a lot of the thriving aspect of work is like really saying like, there's no rush in this process. There's no reason like I can hustle in terms of like, I might want to do two or three things at the same time, but the pace in which I address these three, two or three things has to be my pace and not according to what the world is saying that I need to do, especially in New York. Or hustling even virtually. Like, what is up, people? Like, I don't get it. It shouldn't look like that. It's this mindfulness that we need to really use to approach even like how we're addressing this rebuilding process and this rebirthing process. You know, and you're going to have a lot of people suffering for a very long time if they don't address the, the pace in which we go and the fact that time is irrelevant and that death is inevitable. We have to, like, be conscious of all those things as we're, like, pouring into ourselves and doing self-care work. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this COVID-19 had definitely gave us a sense of stillness or at least an opportunity for us to really face and sit in uncomfortableness. So I could totally relate to what you're saying. And speaking of COVID-19, the Flatbush United, you started right away. So for those folks who are not familiar with what that is in your mutual aid work, like can you share a little bit more about what you do? Yeah, so Flatbush United was not founded by me. It was actually a group of neighbors of different working groups that you know, we were sitting around, um, we have like a neighborhood Facebook group, having done like community partnership work and community engagement work and having known a lot of people in these circles we were getting asked at the time, it was this, me, I've been doing a lot of work with the small businesses. And so I had a lot of small business owners, you know, reaching out to me saying, hey, I don't know what to do. There was no mandates put out yet. It was like, hey, all businesses shut down, do take out delivery when it came to like the restaurant businesses and I had a lot of people reaching out to me in the small business community of like, are you hearing anything? Are you talking to the electeds? Are the electeds saying anything? And some of the other groups like their neighbors were already like two weeks and they're like, I'm out of a job. I can't feed my family. People were giving birth. They didn't have like the proper care. And like, it was a bunch of us in different networks that were like, okay, the electeds are not talking, meaning elected officials are not talking for whatever the reason was. And I think a lot of it was, there was so much unknown. Um, and so we weren't hearing from like our city council people and like our senators and assembly people. I think that we took it upon ourselves as neighbors in the Flatbush area to say, okay, we're gonna come in mutual aid, meaning in mutual exchange or an exchange of, of resources mutually, meaning we don't operate in charity. We operate in solidarity with each other. So for example, if you were to come to me and say, I have this podcast I need to do, but my mic broke and, you know, I don't have work. And I would just say, hey, anybody wants to like touch base with you, girl, um, she has a need for like a mic for her podcast and no one will ever ask you. 
also, where did you work? How much income did you make? How often do you do your podcast? Because we get to trust you as our neighbor to say, she needs support, we're going to give it to her. And in return, you're like, hey, you know, this works. I got like four hours. I'm open to like doing groceries for like four of my other neighbors. And so right now, we are about 2,800 neighbors in the Flatbush area. Um, we've been predominantly supporting some of our neighbors with food, obviously, because there's food scarcity. Um, there's a, another wave that's about to hit, not just with the virus, but a lot of the remote workers are losing their jobs. Um, a lot of people's hours are getting cut. People are afraid to go back to work, even the ones in like the restaurant industry. There's a lot of other things that I think the mainstream media is not talking about, of like just how three months can change someone's lifestyle, but also like how a lot of these small businesses are not going to survive and that's going to affect a whole class of workers and different things. And so we've been around just feeding families. We're feeding about now everything has kind of slowed down in terms of requests for food. So we're feeding about 130 families a weekend. But before we were, we, we fed over 2,500 families in three months, which is a lot. We're 100% community supported, meaning um, donations or contributions coming from the community goes right out um, through food. And right now we're in a unique position where we're going to be taking like a pause at the end of this month to reassess like where we're at right we've grown the world is changing things are reopening and it's time for us to reassess on like how we're how we're in contribution to the community because we are the community right it's it's been great like we don't provide services we are accessible to our neighbors for whatever needs that they want without without putting red tape like we we're not a nonprofit. We're not a formalized um, body. We are having conversations around that because of legalities around mutual aid work and, you know, us being mindful of like where the world is and that although we all have kind hearts and we're open that, you know, there is a potential that legal issues could come up, right? We, we're having conversations that I think in the middle of disaster relief, you're not thinking about, but as we're growing and we're thinking these things, we're still staying away from becoming institutionalized. That would go against what mutual aid is in order to like better uh, show up in the community responsibly. Um, but we've done great work. I personally have, am, am going to be stepping away for a couple weeks. I've been going straight for three months. And so, you know, we're also having conversations on like what it means to like have a healthy balance in community work, which a lot of, you know, people, People in nonprofit, like nonprofit, run you into the ground, right? Like they make you work for nothing and you burn out. And like we're aware of that. We're at a point where like we are in a unique position to reassess everything from like the culture that we have within the group and promoting that externally, right? You know, like what I was saying, like are we asking our neighbors to rest? Are we asking our neighbors how are they feeding their families? Are we um, asking our neighbors what other support do they need outside of food? Mutual aid work is not a unique thing. Um, mutual aids have existed since the beginning of time across different cultures, right? The mom in the village that feeds like all the 15 kids that are not hers, but she's aware that they may not have food to eat. And so you then have another person that's sitting here and transporting these 15 kids. The the one aunt that goes out and like she brings clothes for like the neighbor that just had a baby but doesn't have money. That kind of culture, that village culture, like the neighbor taking care of the neighbor and that we're all family. I think that's what mutual aid does. You know, we're also in a unique position. We have a very powerful voice. I think all mutual aids, when you have bodies of people, it's so unique now because none of us, a lot of us have never met in person. We, a lot of us have never known each other. So it's like you're being introduced to 2,800 neighbors that exist in the same area that you never knew that now you have this bond that won't go away. But some, but we do have also like a bulk buying process where we've assessed food scarcity, food quality, right? Like our neighbors deserve to have organic food and the world needs to stop buying that organic food is expensive. So how do we like go about making sure like our neighbors get the highest quality? Um, we're able to financially sustain that through our donations. And a lot of it's like, we need to go directly to the farmers. We need our farmers to represent the community that we're in, black and brown people all the way, right? And you know, how are we supporting the small farmers? Um, and it's so unique to be in that and 
and so they need to have the relations coming in to be able to make that decision. And so we're talking about food politics, right? Like food justice too. Like what's the history behind like green beans and all these different things? How can we educate like our neighbors on how to cook healthy? It's a very unique way to do it. And mutual aid doesn't always involve like, oh, we're getting food for our neighbors. It could be a mutual exchange of information. Um, it could be a mutual exchange of anything, just anything that you would consider a resource that would benefit someone else without a, a capitalist aspect attached to it, right? So like we don't, we don't pay all of us are volunteer volunteers. Some of us work full-time, some of us work part-time. We don't ask for money in return. No one gets paid. No one's employed. Uh, and it's been great, 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 great work. But it is also time for me to take a rest. Um, we're going through a week of like restructuring and revisiting so many things. And I'm hoping that we come out like stronger and better and like always in the interest of like community. I am so glad to hear that you are taking some time for yourself. It comes down to sustainability, not only for the organization, but it's for yourself. And it really, it's developing and nurturing the new people, the opportunity for them to grow and step into the leadership as well. And I really, really love that. And yeah. another thing that I really loved from what you just mentioned was it is really about community and the village mind that mentality. And Since the COVID, like we have to rely on each other. Okay. We just have to, right? Are there people receptive to this idea of mutual aid or were there any particular stories that people are not willing because especially in the United States, it's such an independent mindset. Oh no, it's, it's a very well accepted idea. I think Brooklyn, where I'm at, has about 50 mutual aids. So it's great to see that. I think our focus is always decentralization. Um, and so, like, we've been talking a lot about continuing to spread out and continue to, like, help neighbors support each other. Like, it should never be, we should never be relying on the government in the ways that we have been. The government has its purpose. But, you know, if you have three kids at home and you have laundry, I should be able to knock and on your door and say, you go, do you need laundry to be done? As long as I'm capable and healthy. Or I can say, hey, I just paid for someone to pick up your laundry, like, get it ready, right? And I think, like, it's not that hard to do. But I think um, when you have a group of people in, like, panic and, like, anxiety, it's hard to think past that. And I think we should always have said, no, it's actually possible. We are doing this work safely. We don't take our masks on. We have gloves. Like, we have packets that we put when we send the groceries of, like, how... People should wash their produce. Housing regulations and legislation that's going through, you know, census. Like we're making sure, like we're also staying civically engaged as citizens. A neighbor might not know how to vote. They might be so caught up in all the classes that their kids have been taking that they forgot the deadline and they're getting like this packet. It's a very unique network, a way of net of networking or creating networking community as well. And I think there's a lot of us that we're like, we're never gonna be each other's lives. It's it's almost impossible. Um, because if we function like this in, in a disaster at this level, which is, you know, coronavirus is gonna become chronic. I think that a lot of people think it's like this one thing like it's going to pass through no it's going to be listed as a chronic disease i'm pretty sure at some point there are plenty of people who are surviving actively with coronavirus like it hasn't left their system and so there's so many other things that i think is coming up where we're like this work is supposed to be permanent this is supposed to be a permanent fixture in society no matter what country you live in this is the only way that people are not starving in their apartments or not you know existing without their lights on in their apartments or you know is able to get a tablet for their kids so that they could finish their school year and able to get like new clothes because they don't have money to even buy newborn baby clothes it's so many different things that i think this this works and i think a lot of people have always been open to that it's hard sometimes when you're in a certain mental state and then you have like the overload of like the media coverage and, and you know we've all been there like I was panicking the first two weeks I was calm but you know I think we all had the same questions like how are we going to survive this and I think we're surviving because there's a lot of mutual aid even if they don't have mutual aid in their name there's a lot of people operating like a village and they're saying I got you and I'm here and what do you need it, it's working um, but I would say 
anyone's interested in finding out more, you know, to go on mutual aid that NYC, there's a whole list of different organizations. There's some nonprofits, there's even like politicians that um, have stepped away from doing campaigning and have like turned their volunteer base into like mutual aid work. Yeah, it's a very well received concept. It is very exciting to learn more about the mutual aid and the people who are really actively getting involved and the fact that people are coming together, like helping each other and the, the sense of humility and that that is a really exciting and a beautiful thing that we get to see through. So I'm going to shift the gear a little bit towards more creative side, still working and connecting together. So you are a creative team of Jeff Brown's One Man Man Show, The Adopted One, and I just love the show, and I love the collaborative effort and the teamwork that you guys all had. How was that to be working with the creative folks that's so powerful? I think it's been great. I mean, it's very similar, right, to the mutual aid. I think uh, the adopted one brought a lot of us together and continues to bring a lot of us together. I know that the play is on hiatus, like everything else. Being part of that creative team really opened up my eyes to what is possible, like, with just an idea. And when you enroll folks into, like, your life's vision. And I think, you know, especially, like, the mission of this play and how it's trying to normalize the conversation around adopting and also like the adoption in, in black communities and what that looks like. And him being an example of what a success story is and getting into the schools and like doing the work that he's doing. I think it's, I think it's been great. It's been, it's been one of the best years of my life creatively. I think even through his play has allowed, allowed me to like be creative and like telling my own story last summer as well with like uh, my art. And so I think, you know, it's, it's hard work. I mean, like, it's vulnerability, right, to be in front of all those people and you're, you know, repeating that story over and over again and then realizing it is you and then saying, hey, you know, I can really impact lives through the way that I even, like, tell this narrative. And it's been unique. Like, I think those of us who work on site, sit on his board and stuff, we get so many different, unique perspectives. And I'm hoping that but when we come back to a different world or a different way of existing, you know, I think that it's probably going to be better than ever. As a creative person myself, you know, it's a unique time. And I think when when we come out of it or when we all decide what this way of existing is going to look like, I think there's going to be so much more creativity coming out of this, whether it's like the Black Lives Movement, whether it's like COVID, whether it's like, I, you know, being isolated, the shutdown, even like election, right? You know, I think it's going to allow to tell their story, tell their trauma, and heal. And so I'm very just excited what this creative wave, this new creative wave is going to look like uh, for people. But I think a lot of it's going to be focused on healing. That's what we we get to keep addressing. Um, This is a lot of like trauma happening to a lot of us. I love that. And I totally agree. The creativity is towards the healing, creativity towards connecting. How do you see your creativity evolving moving forward? I'm definitely working on some installations. Um, I needed more room, clearly, so the room was really good for me. I've been thinking a lot about replicating like elements, like earth and water, and like air. That's been coming to me a lot. But again, I've been just like moving through whatever is coming right now. I think writing, like I write. I've been writing. I've been writing in secret for a couple of years. To, you know, also looking at photography and getting back into like capturing moments that matter to me. I'm also in a very unique stage of like not wanting to share, not out of shame, but like getting out of like this instant gratification or instant sharing culture that we have um, and getting really intentional on like also when I share. So like that's been um, really in my mind around like while I'm creating, like, no, I don't need to like show the background picture like if I create something. Or no, I don't need like to show like those snippets of like this fabric that I just want to create this thing and getting out of that because I think we seek so much validation and it takes away from why we're creating what we're creating and trusting that when when it's time for the world to see it, they're going to see it. Also getting clear on what the purpose is for me being online and that all playing a lot to like how I'm creating. 
It's so intentional what do you do and how you think because we live in a world such so much in reaction. The social media, especially the, all these people sharing the instant gratification and everything is about validation. So like it is so powerful to hear that your intention and your mindset and your creativity comes from so deep within. So thank you so much for sharing that. I'm clear that social media, internet is necessary in the world that we live in. I'm just at a point where I'm like, it may not be necessary for me right now, um, but if the internet and social media wasn't around, we wouldn't know about the protests. We wouldn't, you know, there's so many things that has shed so much light on like a lot of the movements and like veteran conflict, especially now, that I can't take that away from it. But I think it's good to like say like, who am I and where am I? Not only like where is the world at and what is this person doing? It's so destructive to who we are. And I think I'm not here to show the world that I wrap my hair in this green head wrap today. It's okay, right? Like it's okay. Like no one needs to see me, and I should be fine with that. It's more about us coming together to like create something beautiful or have this amazing like experience together that has nothing to do with us validating each other, but more so like us having love for each other whether that is like my professional level too right i should be connecting with you because i love your work and i love how you sound on the podcast and i love the mission that you do not more so like oh hey you go um you know i'm valid i need to validate to say your, your podcast is like the best that's not what it should be it should just be like i love who you are and your work and what you do in social media and i'm like creates like this layer of like pressure and things are not necessary for the path that we're on right now you know people really need to start dismantling mindsets and I think I'm just in that and sometimes I'm overwhelmed by it and some days I'm just like this is perfect this is necessary it's a challenge and I'm going to challenge myself at 34 to move away from things that no longer serve me no longer add value in the world or it's part, it's part of the, the whole data process, right, of detachment and so. It's all the process. I'm into that. Before we go into the last question, if people want to learn more about um, Flatbush United or anything in your consultation service, how would people get in contact with you? So for Flatbush United, if you would like to learn more, we have a Facebook group if you are on Facebook. Um, if you would like to volunteer your time, a person is simply doing phone calls. You could use the bit.ly link, which is bit.ly, I mean, bit.ly forward slash volunteer, the number four for Flatbush. And you could sign up there and someone from the onboarding team will give you a call and get you kind of signed up. We operate our workspace on Slack. And so Slack is where all the magic happens. Facebook is where like the neighbors are really connecting and asking for support slightly differently. Um, when it comes to me, I'm on Instagram, but I've honestly been actively removing myself from social media. I deactivated my Facebook account earlier this month. I want to say the best way to contact me is through email. That's the best way. That's where I'm going right now. I'm migrating to like email only and phone only um, to kind of go back to like basics with myself. Well, I love that. The intentional connection, that is what you're pr practicing. Awesome. So the one last question, like you've shared so many beautiful things about from intention to creativity, to healing and spirituality. So what is the call to action that you will like to share with what is going on in the world right at this moment? Hmm. That is very interesting. I think because I'm doing mutual aid work and I'm seeing such a different perspective. I think the call to action is to check on your neighbors. Not just your loved ones and not just someone that you're living with. I think it's important that we check on the like, who's seat next door. And it and it doesn't have to include you standing like two feet away from her. You know, it could be like slipping a note under her door. There's so many negative things happening with how we treat our neighbors, like neighbors calling the cops on each other. People are struggling. They need support. They don't know how to ask for it. Um, and I think if we intentionally vulnerably check in on each other we do think for that neighbor to be vulnerable and open up and have a powerful exchange with us 
could potentially create a deeper connection that when we come out of this, we will forget this. If you are sitting on your stoop tonight and you see Linda come out, say hi. How you doing? You know, like, are you good? Just checking in. And even if they don't respond to you, don't take it personal. You know, you live in an apartment building, like, knock on the, ne- the door next to you or the door above. Just check in. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing all the wisdom and all the love throughout this conversation, Laura. Of course. It's been great.